So I'm just going to start with a couple questions and then we're going to open it up to all of you and we do need to end right at 12.30. So start to think of questions that you um, might like to ask. There's a, a microphone up front. Um, we'd love to have you come up to the microphone because it's being recorded and it'll pick up your voice better. Um, so we'll start that just in a couple minutes. But I, I mean, I think a natural question is to just kind of start out talking about the nature of play, uh, since we're talking about games, and and that you know play can be described kind of as a kind of experiential struggle, a kind of structure of discovery and experimentation, and um, you know how does that apply in terms of serious games? And then of course we can't talk about games without talking about rules, since that's what kind of makes a game, right? And that there's this kind of tension-filled relationship between knowing the rules and then trying to get between and under and around them. Um, so maybe you could both talk a little bit about kind of the nature of play as you kind of delve into it. Um, and then also kind of thinking about the role of rules in the work that you do. Suzanne, you want to start or should I? Go for it. So I think that there, you know, what you say about there being a deep relation, is this on? Yeah. A deep relationship between rules and play is true, and I think that it's something of a paradox um, that we recognize in games, that, that they have these rules, that they are systems of constraint, um, and that we voluntarily submit ourselves to those systems of constraint so that we will have the opportunity to discover um, these sort of crevices where um, we can slip through those rules and we can be clever and we can be challenged and we can overcome those rules. Uh, and I think that play is that slippage. I think that it's that sense of, um, uh, you know, the, I was calling, we were talking earlier and I called it the imperfect system. So that, that games are not these perfect efficient technologies for allowing us to open bottles faster. Right, what they are, are these inefficient technologies for allowing us to, to use our own resources to be, be creative, be clever, to grow. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, she sped up enlightenment and now, you know, <laughs> what else would you want from play? <laughs> That's it. No. <laughs> um, That's just, uh, um, I, that that would be uh, that would be it. Uh, I mean, I think one interesting thing, um, one interesting thing about sort of games that deal with um, nonfiction. Now, nonfiction is in and of itself, of course, extremely broad. And, and how you know what is the content, and how are you defining it for yourself, um, and you know uh, what's the perspective that you're sort of um, inhabiting. But an interesting thing is, of course. Game designers talk a lot about the possibility space, and I think that's that's the play, right? You have a constrained system, which of course, in and of itself, may fluctuate, right? Along along the play experience, those rules may not stay consistent, may surprise you, may subvert themselves somehow. That's that's that, but there's there's some rules, right? And play is what kind of emerges, and um, and and that's the possibility space, and. Some, something I've been very interested in and also struggling with is that collision because that possibility space can be said to collide with nonfiction because nonfiction, whether it's history or something that's ongoing, you know, it plays out a certain way. It happens a certain way. It doesn't happen in, in a variety of ways. And how do you deal with that? And that collision is, is for me, creatively and ethically, like really rich subject matter. So that's the only thing that I, I would add to that. It's a great addition. I think it, can, it, it also leads to your individual and kind of collective creative process because you do work with a lot of people, but you also, you know, both of you are real engines behind what you do. So I'm wondering if you could talk about your creative process and how it is different or the same than other creative mediums. So literature, three-dimensional installation. So what's the difference, you know, working with Bell Viola on this as opposed to doing one of his installations, which is, you know, incredibly visceral experience. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, I was asking what the difference in kind of their creative process is from other creative and mediums, so literature or visual arts, even installation, film, and maybe talk about how you kind of, how you begin that process yourselves. Uh, so I was trained as a filmmaker, and Susanna, you were too, right? So, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question for me. Um, but uh, specifically in the case of, of working, for example, with Bill Viola, um, you know, after years in the software industry, I'm, I was a, a commercial game designer before I went uh, to academia. And, you know, in the software industry, you have a plan. You always have a plan, right? You know, you set your goals, you, have, you write your plan, you have your spec, and then you make it, right? You execute. Uh, it's very professional. And there's this myth, really, that somehow um, you've solved all the problems when you, when you make that plan. And it is a myth, right? Um, so, but with Bill, uh, you know, uh, it was there, that, we, that myth was stripped away. And it was all about conversation. And um, the process became one of uh, diving very deeply into the form and the ideas and finding not, it, it's, it's one solution for the individuals involved and, and knowing that what you made was informed by all of the skills and the uh, proclivities and interests of, of the, the, the people involved in the process. It was, it's very specific. And I think that um, that was, for me was an interesting intersection, an interesting experience of working uh, with, with someone, with an artist versus being a game designer in a more, in a technical sense, you know, and it really opened up to me a realm of possibilities of how to work uh, that, that I think, you know, most game designers do have their plan and they execute that plan and, and you shut off a lot of interesting side um, possibilities when you, when you do that. Of course, you also spend more money. That's, uh, so did Walden come before or after? Well, the idea for Walden actually came before. The idea for Walden came in 2002. I, I, I had a venture capital backed company and it, clo uh, it closed in 2002 and I took a 10,000 mile ride around the United States trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And my fa father's family is, is um, uh, from Massachusetts and so I went to stay with my cousin and was walking uh, around Walden and thinking about um, what a great, I, for some reason it just occurred to me that the system that he lays out would make a great game. And I wrote a whole bunch of ideas in my journal, but I had no idea how to do it. And I sort of put it away for a long time. And it wasn't until working with Bill um, that I started to th think, I, I actually could think through this process. I could open that back up and, 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 and and do that. And so after the night journey was, you know, sort of at a particular state, it's not necessarily complete, but at a particular state, um, I got a bunch of um, people from the lab who were willing to come paint the fence with me, which is essentially how you get wacky projects done, is you convince everybody that painting this fence is the best job in the world. Mark Twain <laughs> and video game and gaming me, right? Yeah. And so I got these 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 graduate students and, and people who were interested and now I have this amazing team and we are we are on this quest. Um, so the question is collaboration, right? And, How, and, and creative process. And the creative process. Um, I mean, for me, it's, pr it's really different project to project, frankly. Um, um, uh, what is the who and, and what is the project serving? Um, clearly, like T Tracy showed projects that also, you know, there's a variety there. There's a personal project. There's uh, a variety. Um, having said that, um, you know, it's... Uh, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, right, something that uh, we always say a lot so in, in game design is iterate, 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 right? Sort of um, don't be afraid, get in there. This is something that I've, you know, I've, I've learned from Tracy, right? Um, get your hands dirty. It's, it's, it's different from other media because I think other media is kind of, you work towards perfection, 
in a different way in games. It's like, okay, make it imperfect, play test something that is hopefully very in cheap to play test, right? That's why sort of performing or paper prototyping or something before you get into heavy intensive production and see how it works, see what doesn't work. Now, uh, sometimes that's, uh, and for, d depending on the project and depending on, on you, frankly, and your skill sets and your projects, team, uh, your team member skill sets, that may be more and less easy to do or, or clear how to do. At least that's my experience. So it's always a, a different process. And um, in games, in the games that I'm very interested in, sort of moving forward with, um, you know, there is there is this space where different from other media as well. Even though film is very participatory, right? And I come from film, but I also come from fine arts, right? And that's entirely filmmaking and fine arts are indeed, could be argued to be very sort of a different ends of the spectrum, right? Um, but I get a lot of those two practices. And um, I, th I, th I think I work uh, somewhere there in the middle. Um, and, um, but also I was gonna say that in the games that I'm really interested in sort of pushing forward, the process itself is really important, not just the end result. And so for instance, um, I'm currently studying a lot of um, theater of the oppressed. I don't know if that's um, familiar to anyone, but it's a whole set of, it's a theory and, and a practice and a set of practice um, in theater um, established um, uh, about four decades ago by a Brazilian um, scholar and theater practitioner and activist and legislator, Augusto Bowl. And it really does sort of lay the land and how do you do how do you do participatory action research right? How do you really work with communities? How do you make projects that are you know it, you know you have to involve the folks that are going to be served by the project, right? So, but it's easier said than done, and project by project, easier said you know it's always different. So, well, and that and I mean, theater of the press is so much about participation. Um, and using kind of multiple sources of experience, right? Yes. And when people talk about participation, it's as if it's, there's just one kind of participation. Right. So that kind of leads right. in a great kind of segue to audience and maybe talking about who you design for, how you think people will participate, who's going to participate. Do they participate alone, together? I mean, you know, Susanna, you talked about, you know, co uh, cooperative game playing. So, you know, is this a solitary experience? Is it a communal experience? When you are designing it, how are you thinking about the participation and, and who's doing that? Well, oh. Actually, so I'm, so I'm really proud to say that Susanna is one of my students, and so <laughs> we may have some similarities here um, in our <laughs> process. <I know. laughs> um, but uh, we practice what I would call participatory design. Uh, uh, at USC as a sort of a, a methodology. And so um, with many of the projects that we do, we bring the people who are um, going to be the eventual users in to um, play with us and um, help us design. So for example, the college game that I showed, we had a junior design team of students from a local uh, high school who were in the, the target market. These are amazingly bright students, by the way, who. Um, I really hope, I really believe that we help them act in their college quest. Um, but they, by the games that they made, by the discussions that we had, they showed us their fears and concerns and misunderstandings and um, they helped us to define what the goals of the game should be and, and, and really the focus. Now we're actually doing it with a group of junior high school students to um, make uh, an, a game geared towards um, college aspiration. Um, and I think that that kind of process is critical, bringing people in and understanding what motivates them. Because the game isn't for you as a designer. You are, it's like giving a party, right? When you, when you make a game, you are, you are giving a party or creating an environment for the people who you want to you know, entertain. So you're creating that environment. Yeah. And, 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 and you creating can, possibilities of different ways that they can participate. And not everyone is motivated equally this, you know, by the same um, things, of course, but, but part of making a game is giving a promise 
I'm, I'm having this party, what kind of a party is it? Why are you invited, right? And so that, I think every game has that, and um, whether it be sort of a hardcore shooter which promises you a particular kind of adrenaline and strategy and, and really fast-paced action, or whether it be something more uh, like a Walden or, or a Night Journey which, which promises an entirely different kind of interaction. I like that, you know, that it's about giving a promise. I mean, because then the kind of gaming design that you do is really part of, you know, what we call kind of a, a gift economy, right? Like that's the currency, the promise of the experience and the promise of how you can participate. And you've had a lot of experience of that in like having groups participate, obviously with Darfur is dying. So maybe even talk a little bit about that and, you know, and, and your experience in Washington with the... Um. Yes, and, and before I answer that, I also want to say that, that that gift or that promise could certainly be, you know, a big spectrum, right? There's, there's yet so much, I think, to discover with games. Um, and that gift can certainly be, it can be an extremely sort of personalized, autobiographical nugget, you know? It, it can be the, all these things. Um, but uh, regarding the first line, well, um, uh, it, it was, um, we worked with a lot of folks to figure out uh, what, des what design would be, would be appropriate. Um, um, and it was very much actually a very crunch development. But we, you know, I, we sought out uh, genocide scholars and educators and we, we asked, you know, the number one question is how do you teach this? You know, how do you approach the subject matter? How do you teach it? Um, you know, I didn't exhale for like a year, you know. Um, but um, one thing that really guided us was this particular um, educator, um, Donald Miller at USC, who said that um, you know the way he approaches it is is you 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 kind of hook with an, with with really personal anecdotal stuff, stuff that's true and factual and just so uh, uh, unfortunately true and factual and so powerful, and then of course. Um, you know, you have you, you have an audience there, or at least he has his audience. Um, and then you step back and you you have to provide, you know, broader sort of a systemic perspective. You have to place it in perspective of broader dynamics. Where is this powerful narrative exactly situated inside of, you know, one or, or multiple dynamics all sort of interrelating to each and, and having cause and effect, right? And you have to provide that information. And then third, right there and then. Give them something simple and effective. Give them the sense that they are able to do something. It could be a simple thing, but hey, it's it's absolutely something that you are able to impact in the world. And so we ran with that methodology, um, and we uh, worked with NGOs, uh, International Rescue Committee, and the International Crisis Group. We worked with filmmakers that had actually gotten uh, in Darfur when no one was able to get it. You couldn't get in Darfur, and we they graciously. Um, provided imagery, because it was very complicated to know, uh, it was a very, very confusing and messy topic. And often uh, it happened a couple of times that I relied on imagery and information online stuff, and it was wrong. And that just, just, that just made me panic. And I realized that, you know what, the, kind, the system, you know, there's a little bit here that's very much like documentary filmmaking. And, uh, and that's where these, these processes started to merge. So yeah, we worked with NGOs, we worked with educators. Our, college tar our, our, our target audience was very much an, an American college student. So um, we also worked with um, 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 activist students, mainly based at USC and UCLA. So I think we have time for maybe one question, maybe two. <laughs> And then I do want to encourage you all to come down to U Media, where they will be for an hour, and you can ask lots of questions. On the first floor, again, at Van Buren and State. So let me just start with this question. In, the, in some of your examples, it's really clear what the message is, the message that you want the game to send. I'm wondering what's sort of the meta message of creating so many games and people spending so many hours in game worlds where there are work, there are rules, and where are you teaching that life is a game and that the world does have rules, and how intentional is that, and what could be the 
possible downside of immersing people in a lesson through the medium of the game, apart from the intentional message that Darfur and the other ones had. Thank you. That's a great question. Let me just hold the answer. Let me ask, have you asked your question also? And then me, maybe each of you can take one because we're just running over. Yep. Would you mind? Yeah, m uh, mine is a bit simpler. I was just wondering, I, I know you guys are talking a lot about your uh, intended audience being college students. Do you do any um, collaboration, and you're talking about collaborating with artists, do you collaborate with businesses or researchers? And have you also looked into expanding your uh, target base to other demographics? That's Great. Amazing. So the, the, the second question is easier. So just quickly, <laughs> um, uh, yet yeah, maybe that was just a set of examples that it, it tended towards college, but uh, I think that actually um, especially it, it, at the lab, the Game Innovation Lab, we have, we have a number of projects that we do in collaboration um, with, with various research. We work with Sesame Workshop on uh, games, uh, for uh, intergenerational games specifically, and, 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 and other projects as well that cross a wide spectrum uh, of markets. So, so um, yes, the answer is yes. That's, that's pretty, pretty simple. Um, do you want to tackle the harder one? Oh. Or <laughs> How nice that your former professor gives you that one. <laughs> I can do it too. Go if you for want. It. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think it's a really interesting question, actually. Um, and and my my personal answer is that um, games are participatory systems and that they teach us how to deconstruct and understand our own place in other participatory systems. And that in the same way that teaching people how to deconstruct narratives and how, how narratives work on us, that we also need to have a kind of literacy around um, these systems that we are engaging with more and more in our world. And I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing games explode as an expressive form. Um, and because they help us to understand the world um, in terms of these, these, these overlapping and intersecting systems that we are in different places within and that we have different potentials within. So I actually think it's a good thing and I think that what we need to do is teach literacy around system uh, engagement. So we'll take one more quick question and then we have to end. Oh, we have, okay. Yes? So I'm sorry, no he question? said we can't take another question. So if you would come down to U Media on the first floor, I know they'd be happy to answer your question, but we've run over, I'm sorry. Thank you all for being here.